Okay, so let's start going finally into the language. Uh, getting to know this language, of course, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that we already know about programming languages, so I will try only to go quickly and stress the differences or the you know, particular stuff uh, that we find only in JS. Um, the strange thing is that the programming model of JS or the interpreter is that every JS program is uh, thought uh, as a single file from beginning to end. Okay, so there are mechanisms that we will learn uh, to organize the code into different files with importing statements and so on. But uh, from the point of view of the interpreter, it's all like it's one, one big huge file containing your code, your functions, and all the libraries and so on. So it's all right like that. Um, this means that uh, uh, global variables are really global, so they are defined across all the libraries uh, in, uh, in your program. And therefore, you should be very, very careful before using or thinking about uh, anything global, because it will not be global to your program, but to the whole, to your code, sorry, but to the whole program. That's why we should be careful to put everything into modules, into functions, to, to isolate them. Isolate them. The file is first parsed and then executed from the first line. So the model is that we first read the whole file. If you have a syntax error in the last line, the program will not start. Okay? It's not the parsed line by line so that, uh, it, like for example, in Python, for example, you can run the first line and if you get a syntax error, then we'll stop there. But it will run up to this point. In JavaScript, uh, first uh, you check the syntax, uh, read the code, and then start executing that. Huh? So this means that uh, sometimes the program will not even start uh, if uh, it has some, some uh, uh, syntax errors. And uh, uh, there's a standard library which is defined by the language itself, which is uh, quite small, by, by the way, plus a set of APIs that are libraries that are available and provided by the runtime environments. So we, we need to know in some cases where something is in the standard library, so it will be available across all the environments, or is an, an API offered by Node.js or an API offered by the browser, so that we can know that we can use it in the client and not in the server or vice versa. The uh, character set of uh, JavaScript is uh, Unicode. So you can use all sorts of accented or non latent characters, uh, both inside strings and as a, in the language, also as identifiers, for example. Okay? So there's not an issue. All the web technologies are today built on, on Unicode, and so you shouldn't, we shouldn't have any problems with uh, um, characters outside the basic character sets. Uh, the only problem that we'll have uh, is about uh, some concept like the length of the string, uh, we should be careful whether we want actually the number of characters or the number of bytes uh, that are no longer the same in, uh, with, uh, with Unicode definition, but it's a detail that uh, we, we don't need to care uh, too much, okay? Uh, the syntax uh, looks like C. We have uh, braces, uh, we have semicolons, so we may have semicolons, really. They're optional. And uh, so the syntax is similar to C. When, uh, uh, I, uh, Brandon Haidt invented uh, uh, JavaScript in the first uh, 10 days. He uh, was familiar with C, so he used a syntax uh, that was similar to that. So uh, with the comments, with semicolon, with the braces, and so on. Semicolon in JavaScript is uh, optional. Then uh, it means that uh, the interpreter is able to insert a semicolon if one is missing uh, in most of the cases. Whenever there is no ambiguity in syntax, uh, you can leave out the semicolon and the interpreter will just do fine. There are some limited cases in which uh, uh, the syntax will be ambiguous, uh, so the, the interpreter would uh, try to join your instruction for the, with the next one because syntactically joining them would be, um, um, would be valid, huh? would be valid, valid JavaScript. Um, Especially if you have a, a new line, new statement uh, that starts with an open brace uh, or square brackets, uh, that can be interpreted uh, like grouping an expression in the next statement uh, 
or as a function call or an array access in the previous statement. So in that case, uh, it would be ambiguous uh, and you need to put a semicolon, okay? But otherwise, uh, uh, imagine that there, there is an, an already a semicolon at the end of every line. So you put an enter, it's like uh, automatically inserting a semicolon. Then it depends on your style, on your programming style, okay? You may like semicolons and so put them, they, they don't do any damage. You may don't like them and just uh, don't, don't use them. Just be careful about some special cases where they are actually needed, otherwise the code would have a different understanding. Uh, there are many style guides around. Since the syntax has some degree of flexibility, uh, you just try to stick to some style. There are also some code checkers that uh, help you to consistently use a style and follow it, but just a matter of uh, of a preference, basically. While uh, the activation of a strict mode, like we mentioned something that is the modern JavaScript, um, is uh, uh, manual. Okay, so normally when you start uh, the node interpreter, it will start working with the loose mode, or floppy mode, um, uh, no, sorry, sloppy mode, they call it. Uh, unless uh, you put as the very, very first statement of your file, the string uh, use strict. It's just a string, so it doesn't have any effect. Uh, it's uh, just computing a string and discarding the value. But the presence of the string triggers inside the compiler the, the, the strict mode, and so the rest of the file will be executed in strict mode. So at the beginning, in the first exercise, we will uh, need to write this. Then we we'll see that uh, there are many cases in which the strict mode is uh, automatically activated, like when importing modules, when calling from uh, web pages uh, and some other cases, uh, and so we don't need to write it anymore. But at the beginning, when we are starting with a simple script, uh, we need to instruct the interpreter, we want to work with strict mode. Hmm? By default, uh, it's, uh, it's not there. Uh, so just remember to put it as the first line of your file or the first statement in the interactive mode. Um, so, the basic issue, what are the type system supported by JavaScript? So JavaScript is a programming model much like, uh, from the point of view of the, of the type system, um, oh, that calls me of what uh, you have with, with Python, for example. Uh, it's an object-oriented language, so all values are objects, and all objects have a type. Variables do not have any type. So you define a variable and that variable may refer to objects of different types throughout the lifetime of the variable. Okay, a variable is just a reference, is a naked reference to an object. The variable itself doesn't contain any information about the object or about the type of the object it may, it may point to. So that's one big difference compared to .NET or Java or C Sharp or whatever, where the variables are strongly typed, so a variable can only refer to objects uh, compatible with its type. Here, variables are just uh, ref pure references, naked references, right? That can point to objects, uh, to values, of a, different, of a specific uh, type. So everything is an object in JavaScript, even numbers, so they are properties and so on, but we are talking about the values, not the references. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, some primitive type that are predefined, uh, the usual string, number, boolean, and these two boys, null and undefined, uh, that we'll discuss. Um, by the way, number is just one type. We don't have integers and doubles. Number, everything together, mm, happily together. Just they are 42 and 3.14 are the same type. They are both number. Uh, there's no concept of an int uh, in, in, uh, in JavaScript. Uh, strings uh, may be delimited by double quotes, single quotes, or back quotes. In the case of back quotes, uh, there's an interpolation mechanism that uh, can uh, in, will insert va uh, variable values inside the string, like the F strings in Python, just to understand uh, each other, where you can format a string by injecting values. Hmm? Uh, and it will be very useful to avoid concatenating strings and so on. 
Boolean true or false with the slow, lower case T and F, just to tell. And then there are these two strange uh, objects uh, that are actually singletons, so the object to that where for which there's only one value of them. Hmm? Uh, there are classes, uh, the null class, uh, number is a class with many values, many instances. Uh, string is a class with many instances. Null is a class with only one instance, which is called null. And undefined is a class with only one instance, which is called undefined. And these values pop up everywhere. Uh, undefined, uh, you, can, you can guess it whenever you are not giving a parameter to a function, whenever you are not initializing a variable or something like that, it will always have a variable, a value, sorry, and that value would be undefined. Okay? It's a real value. It's not an error. It's, the, it's not an exception. It's a value like 27. Okay? You can test it, you can compare it, you can pass it to a function and so on. And so it's very useful to manage a situation in which you have a variable number of parameters or something like that. You put this value which is by definition uh, uh, representing something that is missing. Null uh, is another way of saying the same thing, that uh, you don't have a value. Maybe this value is not referenced, uh, or you don't. You, it, so it, it's a bit, uh, there's a bit of, of ambiguity whether it's more properly used a null or an undefined in a given situation. We must learn from the libraries what kind of values uh, they return. Okay? Uh, but they both serve the same value. There is no uh, actual value to, to provide. Hmm? And then we have a big uh, container of objects, uh, object types, uh, that can contain uh, two main uh, predefined object types. They are not the only one, but the only the ones that are more deeply grounded into the language, that are arrays and functions, and all the user-defined objects that we can create. Okay? Um, functions are objects. JavaScript is uh, e, e, uh, the most important concept in JavaScript is functions. The behavior of functions is very, very special. At the beginning, it will feel very strange also. But it all comes down the, uh, from the fact that a function is a normal object. So you can define it, you can create it, you can modify it, you can pass it around, you can create uh, collections of functions or passing that as an argument and so on. Okay? And a lot of flexibility and the power of JavaScript comes from this simple statement. A function is a type of object, it's a type of value, it's not a construct in the language. It's one possible object which has a weird syntax where you define the value. Oh, I define an array, I use square brackets. I define a function, I use curly brackets. It's just syntax. But then they are objects and they can be used as objects anywhere hmm? with special cases, with special syntaxes that made them uh, exploit their, their, their properties. Um, true and false are wide concepts uh, in JavaScript. Okay, you have the Boolean values true and false, but then there are, there are some weird rules for converting any other type of value to a Boolean. Okay, it's normal, no? If you have, uh, no, we are from the, from the old times of, of, of C, you know that zero is false and everything else is true, okay? So there's an implicit conversion in many programming languages, not all of them, in many programming languages from a given type to a Boolean whenever we need to have a Boolean value, like in an if or a while statement, right? So what is the rule for JavaScript? The JavaScript says that there are only four objects that map to false. One, two, three, four, five, six, sorry. Uh, uh, and the only values that map to false are here. Zero, minus zero, not a number, not a number is a special instance of the class number. We not a number is a number, sorry for saying that, but uh, JavaScript. So these three are three elements of the class number that map to false, that are considered false. The, we use the word false C, which is not really false, but it behaves like false. Undefined and null, yeah, I was expecting that, empty string. 
That's it. And of course, the literal false. Okay, so these values are false. Zero, you're my friend. Undefined and null, okay. Empty string, okay, I can manage it. All the other values in a Boolean context are considered true. Also, an empty array or an empty object, which is quite uh, anti-symmetric because an empty string is false, an empty array is not. Hmm? So we must be careful, just keep that in mind because it's not regular, say, the structure. Okay? For example, in Python, an empty string is false as an empty uh, array. In JavaScript, an empty string is false, but an empty array is true. Hmm? Then we have, uh, speaking of true or false, we have comparison operators. In JavaScript, we have two different comparison operators, the normal equal equal, and the stronger equal equal equal, okay? Triple equal. What's the difference? The difference is that in the second case, with the triple equals, uh, JavaScript will not try to convert the types of the values being compared to a common type. This is a general rule in JavaScript. Uh, every time it, uh, for every operation, for every operator, for every function call, etc., uh, JavaScript is always trying to convert types. If you have a number and it needs a string, it tries to convert the number into a string. It tries, it does convert the number to a string. If you have a string and you need a number, it will try to convert the string into a number. If, of course, it will be valid. And so on. So we'll do a lot of internal comparison, and sorry, in general type conversions, and then do the operation, the addition or whatever, okay? while uh, the triple equal uh, inhibits uh, this uh, automatic conversion. Hmm. Let's see a couple of examples. And just uh, we, we exploit uh, the example just to get familiar with the environment, okay? So here, here we, I have uh, Visual Studio Code, okay, open. I just tell me, I now, now we selected the, the Let's say the white uh, color scheme because I think that on the projector comes better. So white or dark, light or dark, uh, I don't know. I know there are very strong feelings uh, for the two words. Uh, I don't care, just tell me whether it's, it's, it's easy to read uh, and then we can manage with that. So how can we work in JavaScript uh, in Visual Studio Code? So I created, you, you know, you remember the project Wix that I mentioned before? I created a folder called Wix1 and uh, we let's create a new file called uh, uh, basic.js because we are doing very, very basic things, uh, basic.js. Okay. Um, where we are trying to try, uh, we're creating this file. Uh, we want to use uh, the strict mode. So we'll start with that uh, instruction. Sorry, let's turn off copilot because it's just uh, uh, what's that? Yeah. No, well, what's, uh, disable, okay, no, I don't remember what the way of turning it off. I don't need to, to see it. Okay, okay, uh, let's, I will remember it, uh, uh, to turn it, how to turn it off uh, next time. Um, okay, so let's imagine we can run some statement. Uh, I can write, uh, for example, console.log three plus two, for example. Console.log is the print statement in JavaScript, and three plus two is an expression of static number. How do I run it? Okay, there are a couple of ways of running. Uh, one is uh, to open just a terminal. So we, I open a terminal here in the same folder, and I run the code with node, which is installed on the same computer, basic.js. Oh, sorry, I need to go into the week one node. 
basic.js. And we'll print five. Okay? So that's one way. The other way is using the run menu uh, with the run button here. So I go to the run menu VS Code, click on run, select node, and it will uh, somewhere run, but it was so fast uh, that we didn't see it uh, work. Okay, sorry. And uh, um, another alternative is uh, to use this uh, JavaScript debug terminal, which op opens a terminal. You see uh, a shell here where I run just the not command or this JavaScript debug terminal, which is a terminal in which I can run commands. So I can go again to week one. And I can execute the comments. Uh, the difference is that uh, in this terminal, whenever you run a not command, it will be automatically linked to the debugger. So it will run in debug mode, basically. You can do that also by defining a launch file and so on with specify the debugger. But uh, uh, this is also an, no, an easy way of uh, maybe setting a breakpoint here and running the code and will, the debugger will stop this debugger functionality. You see that it's running. You have the controls for stepping in and out and run and so on. And it's connected to the, to a, to the application that is being run on the console. Okay, so when you want to debug, just uh, run the command into the, the, the JavaScript console. Okay, you can close it. And uh, there's also a way that we lose a lot uh, at, the, at the beginning of running a, a node in an interactive way. Since it's an interpreter language, you can just run a node and type comments here in the command line. So if I write uh, 3 plus 2, it will tell me 5. So we'll interpret the comment in real time. Uh, for exiting, you just control D and uh, you exit from the You're given end of 5 with control D. And this also works in the JavaScript console, which is very useful at the beginning for exploring. So if I, in the, con, in the JavaScript console, I run node without any parameter, it will give me a prompt attached to a debugger. Okay, so whenever I write, I define variables, they will be shown there. So I will keep this open to try instructions. Uh, let's just use a use strict uh, as, a pre, as a first uh, instruction. Also, of course, in interactive mode, I need to, to, to move to strict mode, okay? So what, we, what, are, what we're, we're saying is the Boolean comparison, for example. So for example, three equal to two is false, and three equal to three is, of course, true. But beware that three equals two, the string three, is also true uh, because JavaScript sees different value, values of different types uh, and tries to bring them to a common type before doing the operation. While if you want to suppress this uh, conversion, you can use the triple equal and will tell me that, okay, the string and number are not the same. So normally, I would try to get the habit of using the triple equal unless we are expecting uh, that we want to do this kind of conversions. And this can also be tricky. For example, 3 plus 2 is 5, but 3 plus 2 is 32. Uh, the string 32. Uh, but 3 minus 2 is the number 1. OK? There, of course, there's a, there are rules, okay? Uh, plus is an operator that may work between strings and, and numbers. The most common type from, from a string or a number is a string. So first, it tries to be a conversion to strings, and then do the semantics of the concatenation of strings. Minus is an operator which is only defined by among numbers, not among strings. So it will try to convert the string into a number, and then do the subtraction of the numbers. So there's a lot of nice places here that we don't want to go. 
uh, they are just a consequence of this uh, attempt of the JavaScript interpreter to do type conversion for us. Don't, they don't require us to do explicit type conversion. There are a lot of uh, automatic ones. And uh, in many cases, it's nice because it saves us code. In some cases, it can be tricky because you can get something not really expected. Or 3 plus, uh, 3 minus uh, E, if whatever, it gives you, it doesn't give an, an exception. It gives a result of type, which is a number called not a number. That tells me you know, the result of the conversion. So there are also strange, strange things. Uh, no, they're not strange. They're defined in this language. It behaves in this way. Just, we just need to be aware. And uh, my suggestion, try to avoid this situation. Okay, uh, numbers, uh, we said there's no distinction between integers and reals, uh, so it uh, hmm, automatically selects uh, the type of data depending on the operation that we are trying to do. So it tries to understand what's an, an integer or, or, a, or a double. Of course, for some operations like the modulus operators, that works differently mathematically between integers and between reals, uh, it can become, uh, there can be, Corner cases uh, that are strange, but again, we try to avoid corner cases uh, and write uh, clean code, knowing that the language has some, not dar dark, but gray areas, okay? Um, and the special values undefined is uh, for any variable that we have declared but not initialized, um, basically, and these variables could be local variables or could be function parameters, uh, could be object properties. Every time we need a value, maybe you are declaring the name, but you are not, not assigning any value. Hmm? Uh, null, uh, okay, it's an empty value. It's generically written because it comes out in a, different, in a lot of different places. Uh, they are called, uh, sometimes use the word nullish uh, to talk about uh, both uh, undefined and, and, uh, and null. And then not a number comes out for any arithmetic operation which is not valid, so division by zero, or parsing a string into an integer when the string is not, uh, cannot be converted to a number. Variables, so as I said, they are pure references. So they don't have any type. They only refer to a value. And there are three ways of declaring a variable. Okay? In strict mode, variables must be declared. Okay? Um, in a not strict mode, uh, there is no need of declaring variables, so you can just assign a value to them that was somewhat uh, considered dangerous. There are three ways, uh, and they um, vary according to this table. Let's uh, actually there were there were four ways of declaring variables. Let constant var. Let's focus on the first two, let and cos, which are the modern ways. Var is a, a legacy from the past that can be used, it's still valid, but it has, it has strange behaviors. So let's focus on the easy one, let and const. Let defines a variable, const defines a constant. Means, meaning that a variable whose value cannot be changed later on. Okay, can you reassign a value to a variable? Yes. So, for example, if I say let a equal 5, okay, undefined is not the value of a, it's the result of the let operation. Let does not return any value by itself, but if I query uh, a, it becomes uh, 5. So I define a variable, I can change the variable, the value assigned to it, for example, a equal to 7, I print a now is 7, and so on. I cannot redeclare it, let, if I try to redeclare it uh, uh, with, uh, with a different number, this is wrong because it, I'm trying to create a new variable with let, so let creates a variable every time. Once you create it, you can change it many times, but you cannot redefine it. So that's the meaning of these first two columns. Let can be re a value of a variable defined with let can be reassigned as many times as you want. You cannot declare it, uh, you cannot overwrite this name with another let instruction. 
Um, if you try to assign something which is not defined, what happens here? Let's use it, uh, sorry, I, it, it didn't catch the use restricting statement. Let's try to write it in the code. I say let a equal to five, which is running. No, uh, so I didn't save it. Okay, we have a, and then a equal to seven, I wrote, we, I print it again. And then it, I maybe try to assign b to five, to 13, 12, whatever, and see what happens. And what happens is that it's printing the five and the seven, these two log operations, and when it, I try to assign b to 12, it tells me b is not defined, okay? So this is a protection if you, are, if you mistype a variable and you didn't declare it, uh, you'll get an error. Huh? Uh, for example, in Python, you would just define a new variable without any error, so this is better uh, here. Okay, from the programmer's protection. So you need, uh, in this case, to, to, to remember to define it in strict mode. Without strict mode, you, it, would, it would just define a, a new variable without any, any warning. And the const, uh, if you define a new variable as const, you can do that, you can print it, of course. 12, you cannot reassign it. So if sorry, now B is 10, you would get a runtime error. A runtime error of type assignment to constant variable. Okay? So it means that you cannot reassign a new value to a constant, which is a good notion for a constant. Uh, just uh, beware that uh, is the assignment of the variable which is protected by const. Because if the value itself is changed, you can do it. For example, we didn't see objects or arrays yet. But if we, we assign the value, of a, uh, we, we create a const of type array, we can add or remove or modify values in the array as long as the variable is still pointed to that array. So if uh, a variable is pointing, it references a mutable object, the object can be mu muted, mutated, sorry, not muted. The object can be mutated, can be changed. What can be changed is that the, that specific variable will always point to the same object. So it's only the assignment of the variable that is affected by the let or const declaration. By good practice, in JavaScript, we tend to use uh, most of the cases const. So let's get the habit of writing. When you need a variable, declare it as const. There are some cases, you know, if you want to compute a sum, so you need to accumulate a value, sum the same value many times, then you must modify that value. So that would be a, a let declaration. By, but by default, let your fingers no, know to write const when you define a variable. It's uh, basically, if you think about uh, the function, the code you write, in many cases, you define something because you need to use it, but it's seldom that you need to re re uh, change the value of, of, a, of a variable. Okay, so it's better to have the two sub cases separated um, and uh, it, it prevents us for modifying a variable without, uh, no, without uh, noticing. Uh, variables defined with let or const are scoped. It means that if you have a block, uh, block uh, defined by an if statement, by a while statement, by a function body, and so on, the validity of this statement is only inside that, that single block. As normal, this is valid in, in most of other programming languages. Okay. Um, there is also var, which is the old uh, version, that is very sim oh, it's somewhat similar to let, so it declares a variable that uh, uh, can be changed. 
but it can also be redeclared. So if a var a equal to five and the bottom and the bottom var a equal to seven, it doesn't generate any error. It just redefines the same variable, hmm? which is sort of strange because in this way, you know, the you cannot detect it if you are using a variable name that you already used for something else before, huh? because it just redefines it. And the scope is not uh, the point, and this get made worse because the scope of, the, of a variable defined with var is not just the block or the function where you defined it, but uh, the whole function. Or if you are outside the function, the whole file. Even if you are declaring the variable at the bottom, the variable is uh, hoisted, with a very, very strange word, means pulled up at the beginning. All the de var declarations, you can imagine a lift that pulls them up at the first line of the file, even if they are at the bottom. So in some cases it's useful when you want to have forward references to something because it will, uh, uh, they will have they behave like if they were defined, defined but not initialized, and this is tricky. You define the variable which is initialized and not initialized until the point in which you are really initializing it. So this was the old uh, behavior of, uh, of variables in JavaScript. Uh, I find, and it's still supported, okay? But uh, if probably it's cleaner to program with uh, Latin const unless we need this basically hosting, hosting mechanism, which is mm, mm, strange for variable, it's more normal for functions. If you define a function at the bottom, it's nice to be able to call the function since the beginning of the file, okay? Uh, but for variable containing, say, numerical string or object values, uh, I would learn and use these two, okay? Const by preference, unless we really want to redefine this reference, uh, and then we declare it with, with let. Or just let, if you, if you care about your finger, you want to write only three letters instead of five. Um, okay, this was the, basically the example that we had. Uh, this is an example of, of the strange behavior with hoisting. I, I, won't, I won't spend too much time with that. Uh, the idea is that you define a variable C here, okay, and inside a condition or whatever. Actually, the variable C printed here is not an error. It's not an undefined variable. It's a defined variable with an undefined value. Okay, it may seem strange, but uh, I cannot print B here because it's defined there. B is valid only inside these braces. Even if this B here is not valid. It gives an error. The program stops. Here, console.log C doesn't give any error because C is a variable that is defined. It's been defined here and it's been hoisted up to the Top of the function. So, like here, we had uh, var c. Of course, at this point, uh, the code doesn't know which value c is going to assume later on. And so it creates a variable with a value, everything must have a value, and the value is undefined. And in fact, this value here is, will be updated, so we are in some sort of redefining the variable with a, an actual value this time, which is like 2 and so on. So, it may be strange. If you find this strange, just don't use it. Hmm? Um, especially when in JavaScript we are moving towards functional programming, so with everything, we try to write everything in order not to have any side effects. Uh, um, the behavior of var would be uh, intuitive, uh, counterintuitive in, 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 that, uh, in that environment. Okay? okay, that's the strange part. Then we have the what we expect for any programming language. A set of operators, um, which are basically uh, copied for what we can find in, in C and in Java and so on, okay? So assignment operators, we have the equal, uh, just uh, this is a declaration which creates a new variable and gives an initial value, and this just modifies a um, previously defined variable. And then we have all the updating assignments uh, that we are used with C, so the plus equal, minus equal, and so on. 
all the short ends, nothing special. Comparison operators, equal, not equal, real equal, really not equal, so suppressing type conversions, greater, greater than, and so on. So this is the nothing, no. You should have guessed it. The comparison operators uh, also works with objects, but uh, beware that uh, they always com compare the references to the objects. So if we have two identical objects, so two different objects with the same properties and the same values of the properties, they don't compare equal. So the comparison doesn't go inside objects to check what they contain. They only ch it only checks for a reference identity. Are these two the same, the very same identical objects or not? Okay? Like the, if you think about Java, like the equal operator, the comparison operator in Java, equal equal, compares the references, while the equals method compares the value according to the equals uh, implementation. Okay? There is no equals implementation in JavaScript, only comparing the references. If you want to compare the values, do it yourself. Hmm? Um, what you don't like is that the other comparison operators, so minus and more and so on, try to convert the object into a string and then compare the strings, which is a stupid thing to do, but uh, beware, okay? Well, we wouldn't probably compare two objects with a less than or greater than sign, okay? But, uh, because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but uh, the problem is that it doesn't give uh, you an error. It just does a string conversion and compares the strings, and maybe true or false, uh, depending how the object is serialized into a string. Hmm? Not nice to see. And uh, um, there are a lot of automatic type conversions, okay? Uh, and, and so JavaScript is doing the work behind the scenes, but there are some times in which we want to force some type, type conversion, okay? So what I try to collect in this picture is uh, all the possible explicit conversions that we can ask. Okay, I really want this to be a number. So it's a string, I want it to convert to a number. How can I do? I can try a string and for converting it to a number, this arrow, I can call the number, this is the construction for the object number that takes a string parameter or use the unary plus operator, like when I write plus three, it's not an addition, it's just uh, the sign of the number. If I use, apply it to a string, uh, JavaScript says, oh, uh, the unary plus operator only applies to a number, so let's convert the string to a number, okay? Or a string minus zero, ugly to see, but it works, uh, uh, or oh, there's a parse int or a parse float uh, that look like different, uh, they are different in the sense that uh, the parsing will stop at the decimal point and parse float will continue, but at the end the result will not be an int or a float. It will always be a number. So you see a, little, a lot of history here. No? Uh, functions that are being introduced uh, and once they are introduced they keep, they keep staying there in the library forever even if they are not really, really consistent. Uh, I would do this, of course, uh, probably, but the code that you see around uh, does all of the strings. From number to string, it's the same, we are a string constructor or just concatenate with an empty or something like that. Uh, converting something to Boolean, well, we already have a truthy falsy rule. Just uh, remember, falsy is uh, zero, minus zero, not a number, empty string, uh, null, undefined, or false itself, okay? Everything else is true. If I want to force the conversion, I can use the Boolean or, or Sometimes they write like this, not, not a value. So the first not converts the number to a Boolean, but the wrong Boolean, and so you apply not again to get the real value. Uh, just, uh, you, you see a lot of code around that does this kind of tricks, and some people get really excited by this kind of tricks. But, uh, okay, that's... Uh, okay... Um, well, other operators, so logical end or not, uh, with the same syntax as C. These are very important. These are not, these are not the bit, bitwise operators, okay, for doing mass. They are logical then between Booleans. Well, in JavaScript, they are not between Booleans. 
there are more general operators. Like you see, the, the end operator, the result is not uh, a Boolean. The result is uh, expression one, if expression one is false or is falsy, or expression two. Okay, it sounds with like an end because if the first term is false, the result is false. But if the first term is an empty string, which is falsy, the result is not false, it's an empty string. If the first term is a seven, the result is not true or false, is the value of the second expression. For example, if I say something like, in the debug terminal, uh, seven and by, the result is a string, is by. Uh, okay, we can live with that, but it's very, actually, very useful. For example, the, especially the OR operator, but also the end operator. The end operator can be used uh, to compute or suppress the computation of an expression. Uh, if we have some uh, flag and uh, expression, for example. If flag is zero, is false, then the expression is not computed. It's a sort of an if. If flag is true, then do expression. If flag is false, then do, don't do the expression. And it doesn't even compute it because there's shortcut evaluation. Once you know the result, you don't even look at the, the other expression. So it's, uh, the end operator can be used as sort of, a, of an if statement inside a bigger expression, and we use it a lot. It's not readable, I know, but it's very convenient. And the same uh, for the OR operator, value or default value. What does it mean if I have a, a function that expects a value, for example, then we check if uh, the caller of the function really provided the value or not. If it provided a value, seven, then this expression, the OR expression, if the first element is true, it returns the first element. So if value is seven, this expression returns seven. If the first value, if the value is missing, okay, then the first element is, will be undefined. Undefined is falsy, and so if the first uh, argument of the OR operator is falsy, then the result of the OR is the second parameter. That would be a default value. Hmm? Very convenient. If uh, value is not defined, then value equal to default value in just one statement. So we get used to, to this kind of idioms to write in our code. Okay? At the beginning, they are strange, but after a while, uh, we, we, we get used to them. Just beware, also the empty string is false. Okay, so this function, we treat an empty string, we cannot be called with an empty string, because then it will be replaced by, by the default value, which is not what you want. So there are, they are convenient, but they are also dangerous, because that freaking empty string there, which is false instead of true, which, is, which breaks the symmetry. Hmm? So there are used, uh, not, not much for their Boolean value, but more for the shortcutting value. Hmm? Okay, other operators, we have all the, um, uh, you know, arithmetic operators that you want, also the plus plus for incrementing, uh, remainder, and so on. All these operator, uh, uh, operate on numbers, except addition that also operate on strings, string concatenation. Um, this, this guy will be for later. I don't, don't want to enter into knowledge today. But there are operators to, to deal with null values. Uh, 
uh, but okay, it's not for today. The ternary operator that you may remember from C, from the C language, uh, that you already hated in C, is still here, and I'm afraid to say that it's still very used, especially when we go to React, uh, we'll use it a lot uh, to, since React requires you to create an expression that uh, defines the, the page, uh, if the page can be, should be customized according to some condition, you will use this uh, instead of make, making many ifs, uh, we should use the, the ternary operator. Hmm? So we are uh, unfortunately forced, to, forced, or not forced, but uh, you know, pushed to, to dig into our uh, worst habits uh, of programming uh, with these programming tricks and so on. Okay, we have a math mathematical library. There's everything you expect from a mathematical, mathematical library. Uh, we have a, a global object math uh, with all these methods. Okay, nothing special here to see. Control structures, again, nothing new to see here. If, uh, else if, uh, else, uh, as you can see, the curly brackets are optional. If you have only more than one statement, you can omit them, but let's put them anyway. Semicolons are optional. Uh, a switch is working with a, a number or a string um, uh, argument. Okay, so it's not just limited to numbers. Uh, of course, we have the break uh, like in C. They are really copied. This, these constructs are really copied from the C language. Um, we have loops. Uh, the four, the classical uh, four with three parameters. Uh, and normally, the first uh, element uh, tries to normally defines a new variable. Uh, for looping, for four const e uh, equal to zero, i minus uh, less than 20, uh, i plus plus, no? classical C style loop, um, or do while or y. So they are again copied by C. We will find that when we learn uh, something more about uh, functional programming, we will use loops uh, much less than in other languages. No? Because loops are used to process uh, sequential data normally, so arrays or something like that. Uh, and this can be done more efficiently and more you know, compactly with, uh, with functional programming. So uh, they are there, but they are less used than in other languages, the loop constructs. There are two special va uh, variations of the for in um, statement that is used to iterate across uh, collections. And they are uh, not very intuitive. Let's say that uh, the format you want to remember is for of. For of. Okay? For of is the equivalent of for semicolon in Java. Sorry, semicolon. Colon in Java. No, semi. Yeah, colon. Two point. For colon in Java. For string A colon list of strings. Or the for in in Python. Here is called for of. Okay, not my fault. Uh, for of iterates uh, over the elements of an iterable object, so I'll, an, um, an array or other kind of uh, object with an iterator method. There is also a for in form which does not do what we expect. For in iterates over the properties of an object. So if you have an object with five properties, A, B, C, D, name, date, uh, age, or whatever, it will iterate over the names of these properties. Sorry, not the name, the values of the properties of an object. So this happens when you have an object and you don't know which property it has and you want to browse through these properties. A sort of a reflection operation. Okay? Um, but uh, if you try to apply that to an array, the array is also an object. And it also has some uh, properties, uh, but these properties are the indexes, 0, 1, 2, 3, but also the other properties like length. So it will behave in a strange way. So my suggestion is uh, whenever we, not, we need to do a for, let's try it. First, probably the for of variant. If it's not sufficient, then we go back to the uh, old style force, but old style loops. Or 
as we will learn next week, uh, the functional methods uh, that are much more efficient in transforming, using, uh, and uh, uh, operating on, uh, on sequential data structure, on uh, iterable data structures. Um, so the control co structure, except from the for of, the control structure are copied from C. The exception handling, in, handling is copied by, from Java. Try, catch, uh, and throw are the keywords, uh, and they behave like uh, the normal exception handling. Exceptions are less frequent in JavaScript because, as we know, the language is trying, maybe it returns not a number instead of giving an exception, or maybe it returns undefined instead of, instead of giving an exception. So the language is much more forgiving. You may like it or not, no? depending uh, on your feeling about these things. But of course, there are exceptions. You can generate them, and you can catch them in the normal way. Um, so this is just the basic data. The first uh, structured data, and also the arrays and functions, we said, they are the two predefined objects, and they are both important cornerstones of the language. An array is, uh, is not just uh, like uh, you know, uh, a low-level collection. It's a rich data structure, OK? A lot of functionalities. It's a con is an order container of objects of arbitrary types. So there's no, an array. there's no notion of an array of numbers. It's an array of objects. Each of them may be a number, string, another object, another array, whatever you want. Um, you can define an array just by opening a square bracket. And uh, the arrays basically can allow you to access to a single element, to a single, by using the index from zero, and have a property length. Uh, length is a property. So it's dot length, uh, it's not a method, it's not dot length uh, parenthesis, okay? It's not even a function, it's not length of an object. It's array dot length, without the parenthesis. Uh, and we have a lot of methods uh, that uh, let us operate on an array or over an array. And just we must be careful that because some methods modify the values of the array. So modify a number or add uh, an item or delete or something like that. Other methods will return a new array with the modification applied. So just be careful. Uh, okay, we should be careful at the beginning, but uh, especially later on when uh, I always think about uh, the future when we're going to to work on React, there are some cases in which it's very, very important not to modify a variable. And also, in functional programming, you never modify a variable once it has been assigned. You always create new ones to return, because you want a program which has no side effects. Hmm? It may seem strange at the beginning. Again, it's one of the strange things, uh, that ways of thinking that we have to learn here. But the, easy, the simple uh, syntax is uh, we create an empty array like this. An array with three numbers, so an array with a mixed uh, set of values, uh, zero, index 0, 1, 2, 3. Mm. Just, uh, you just create them. We, uh, there's also a constructor called array.of, but uh, it's much more convenient using square brackets that we don't even care about uh, uh, learning this syntax. Mm. Uh, the elements uh, are, of course, indexes from 0 to length minus 1, and it's forbidden to uh, use indexes that are outside this range. We don't declare a variable, we don't declare the length of a variable, so the length property is adjusting automatically. Uh, this is a strange thing here. In many languages, it's forbidden. You define a variable, uh, um, an array with zero element, and then we assign to one element, which is not there. V0 is, doesn't exist yet. We are assigning a value to, a, uh, to an element of the array which is created at the same time of the assignment. Okay, so it's quite strange, but it works. It's supported. It's like adding a property to an object. Simply, this property is associated with the index 0. And if it's not there, it's created. It's a sort of dynamic uh, creation of property. So you cannot index an element that is outside the range because it will return undefined, but you can write it. You cannot read it, but you can write it. It's a bit uh, 
It's not common, this, this kind of uh, structure is not common. Uh, you, we throw, if you want to create uh, an array in an incremental way, we tend to use the push method uh, that adds the element uh, at the first free index. Also because in this case, you have to keep track of the index yourself. Zero, one. You can also assign the position 20. And it will put an item in 20 and leave empty all the others, which is a concept that we don't want to deal with because it's quite, quite contrary to the notion of an array. You have a question? Yeah, it, it's, it's possible to have uh, sparse arrays in which not all the, so the length of the array doesn't really match in these cases with the number of elements in that. It's uh, unsettling, okay? So usually we try to, it's supported by the language, but it's not very intuitive to, to manage, okay? Um, okay, so we usually tend, when we want to modify an array by adding or removing elements, uh, instead of uh, putting them into location that requires us to keep track of the locations, we just tend to use these four methods, okay? Push adds an element at the end of the array, so increase the length of one. Pop removes an element from the end of the array. And then there are the other two that are shift and unshift that add or remove an element at the beginning of the array. And this, with these four methods, you can do a lot of stuff. You can carry an array, you can create FIFOs, you can create uh, LIFOs, uh, last in, first out, first in, first out, uh, queues, uh, buffers. So a lot of use cases are just covered by this uh, sequential data structure, where in this case you are not uh, inserting or modifying the order of the element or some, putting something inside, but only working at the two ends of the data structure. You don't need to declare anything. You can, uh, it can work both ways uh, at any time. So that's why I said it's very flexible. We, uh, there are, uh, in, uh, compared to other languages, uh, the uh, standard library has less uh, container types uh, because arrays are so versatile in this case. Um, JavaScript is a complex language to be interpreted, so let's not make assumptions of what happens under the hood. The C programmer that lies inside us is saying, okay, but unshift is uh, slow because it needs to shift all the elements to the right one position. We don't know, okay? The internal implementation of the arrays may be much more optimized than we think. So these are our mental model, but not, not, don't map it to a, a, a contiguous, uh, in your mind, to a contiguous set of memory, contiguous set of memory cells, okay? Maybe it's not that. The layer of interpretations of the language are much more optimized. So just maybe it's a, it's a linked list or it's a linked list with an associated uh, um, pointer table. Uh, there's, there are, you know, 30 years of optimizations here. So let's use the language for what it is and not try to second guess what the compiler would do, okay? Unless we have proof that a given operation is low in our code with a benchmark not with our feeling. Hmm? Um, arrays are objects, eh? so you can copy the reference to an object. We have the usual reference plus value model. So the objects live in the heap and the reference live in the stack. You can copy a reference around. So I define the variable uh, and an array here and I ass uh, assign an alias, a second name to the same. So what I'm doing here is I create a variable called alias and I initialize this variable with a value coming from the variable v. What is v? v is a reference to an array. So alias will get the same reference to the same array. So when I, when I modify the second element of alias, it will modify also the eighth into five. Both V 
and the alias are now A5, A5, the 8 has disappeared because V and alias are two variables that ref refer to the same object, to the same array object. Okay, so we are just copying, like here, V and alias are two different variables that refer to the same object. So uh, whether I modify or, or I read uh, the object properties through V or through alias is the same object. So every time we assign an object name, we are assigning and sending around preferences. If we want to make a copy, we should make an explicit copy. And for example, in arrays, uh, there's a method array.from that makes a shallow copy. Shallow copy means that it creates a copy of the array, but if the elements inside are arrays, then they are referred as, as aliases, not, uh, uh, but yeah, we just, we must always be aware, okay, I'm, I might bring along the same object so that the other guy can modify it, or I need to make a fresh copy so that every modification are not affecting my original, uh, my original object. Hmm. Um, for, okay, so this is just a warning, and we'll see, especially when we go to uh, functional programming again, I still mention this because it's a, a shift of, uh, of, of way of, of programming. Uh, we'll, we'll exploit this and see how, how, it, how it relates, okay? How it creates a new array by manipulating a current one. Um, there are also other array methods, okay? Concatenation, uh, joining an array to a string uh, with a delimiter, extracting a subarray, a, a slice of the array from a point, starting point to an end point, uh, and it extracts uh, an uh, just uh, have a look uh, at the bold words, uh, a new array, a new ar string, a new array. So all these methods create new arrays and return them. The splice methods modify the elements in place. So it doesn't create a new array, it modifies the existing one. Splice is very powerful because uh, it's a, uh, it, it's uh, Start from a given point, starting from a given point, it removes some elements and adds some other elements from that point. So you can use it to insert a new element, you just splice or index zero new element. So you, from that index, you remove nothing, zero element, and you add that one. Or you can just delete without ending, adding anything. So you can remove or add elements uh, in between the string, or remove and, then, and add them at the same time so that, that we are replacing, okay. Uh, reverse sorting, sorting very, relies on strings. So it's only sorts according to the string conversion of the element, so be careful. If you are trying to sort an array of numbers, mm, it will not give, give you a, num a numerical order. Um, you can search an element with the index of, uh, last from the beginning, from the end, last index of, start from the right or from the left, uh, includes uh, whether an element is, in, is included or not. So it doesn't tell you where it is, but it only tells you whether it's there or not. So it's faster in the same way. So all the methods for, for manipulating arrays, plus some special uh, syntax, because, okay, these are normal methods that are in standard libraries uh, for, for arrays, but there's a special syntax uh, that makes many operations quite uh, convenient. Uh, they are called destruction assignments or the spread operator, the three dots, and so on. That, uh, uh, again, like the Boolean operators, you know, are very useful shortcuts, uh, and uh, we, it requires a bit of understanding how, how, how they work, but they are very convenient. So, for example, but this, I will leave it for Thursday. I will only show you that uh, a way of creating a copy of the array, and usually we, we try to use this word, we tend to use this format because it's much, uh, much shorter, okay? Creating a new array by spreading the elements of an existing array. We'll come to these uh, strange forms uh, on Thursday morning, because now I want to close five minutes or a couple of minutes before. Um, so thank you for today. Uh, Thursday morning, 8.30, room 
R3B altogether. It will be a bit smaller than this one, but uh, okay, I think there are still uh, empty spaces here. Thank you.